Well, good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Todd Sanders. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber. I am so pleased to welcome you to our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Employer Forum this morning. Now, these quarterly forums gather us all together to, dis to discuss strategies and solutions surrounding DEI initiatives in the workplace. And our goal is to help your organization either begin to take these first steps in the DEI practices world, or if your company is already in that journey to continue along the journey, we wanna be your partner. Uh, what I'd like to do first is to first thank our professional committee, as well as the sponsors for today's program. And our sponsors are APS, SRP, the Arizona Diamondbacks, Cox Communications, and Ideas Collide. We are grateful to them for all of the support they've given us over the, the years with this program. Now, hopefully your teams have been able to utilize our DEI toolkit for business, which can be found on the Chamber's website if you haven't seen it yet. And since these initiatives are always evolving, we're excited to announce that the business toolkit was recently updated with additional resources and information uh, that I think is relevant for where we are today. Now, today's program is, is uh, structured as both informative and interactive to answer your questions. And we're also gonna provide some guidance. We're gonna be hearing from Jeanine Montana Bay, Director of Network Operations, West Co-Chair, IDE, Cox Communications, and our newly minted Chair of the Greater Phoenix Chamber's Professional DEI Committee, focused on the culture of NICE. We're gonna open it up after uh, after the presentation, we're gonna open it up for a Q&A and dialogue. So we encourage your active participation, be thinking of any questions you may have, and feel free to submit them um, into the Q&A box at any time. And we'll make sure we get to those. Now, I'm pleased to introduce Janelle Janine to speak about the culture of NICE, as well as some aspects of her role as our new DEI committee chair. Janine, welcome. Thank you, Todd. I really appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen, and if you could be so kind as to let me know, um, just to make sure everybody can see it, I would appreciate it. Is that yes. coming up okay for everybody? Perfect. It is up. Thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm super excited to uh, have been named the new chair of the Professional DE&I Committee for the chamber, we've done amazing work over the last couple of years that I've been involved in. Even before that, um, our toolkit is a great resource for everybody. And I'm really excited to see uh, what we're gonna do for the committee as we move through the year. So thank you all for coming today. Todd already introduced me, so this is just a, a quick reminder, but I am the Director of Network Operations uh, for the engineering team for Cox Communications and also do work uh, on our ID&E team locally as well. But Cox has a very solid commitment to inclusion and whether it's looking at different people's perspectives, um, reaching priorities of our customers and suppliers. We work through various programs throughout the year. We have a, a STEM career fair coming up actually next week internally, and we're very excited about that to share some of the roles that uh, our team members can grow into. We, uh, it's a very big commitment to us along with volunteerism. So today we're gonna talk about the culture of NICE and we'll talk a little bit about what that definition is, some of the statistics around that and as a leader, how you can help your team or your company overcome that to get better results across your company. So the definition for a culture of nice is a culture of nice occurs when people have good intentions, but find it difficult to publicly argue with one another out of a desire to be liked or not rock the boat. And you may have experienced this in your own career at some point where you're, you really want to say something, but you're wondering if it's the right thing and any political payback that you might see if you do share your honest opinion. Another way to look at it is good vibes only. Everybody wants to be positive and friendly and make everybody feel good, which is great, but it really keeps you from having an honest conversation. So if bosses are too invested in everyone getting along, they also fail to encourage the people on their team to criticize one another for fear of showing, of sowing discord. They create the kind of work environment where being nice is prioritized at the expense of critiquing and therefore improving actual performance. And it, this really comes into play as, you know, you're having team meetings and looking for ideas. You know, the worst thing you can do as a hiring manager is hire people exactly like you because you won't get 
the diversity of thought across your teams. And especially when some people are naturally quiet, um, they may be the ones that are, are thinking of a great idea. And if you aren't able to reach out to them and ask them for their inclusion and their thoughts, um, you may be missing out on some really great opportunities. So here's some statistics about what the culture of NICE can look like. Nearly 83% of employees have chosen not to share a concern or negative feedback at work. And eight out of 10 full-time employees admit they keep their concerns to themselves. So if you think about that, if you have a team of 100 people, you're only getting ideas from 20 people. 80% of the, or 80 people don't have, or 80% even don't have, don't share their concerns for fear of not fitting into the nice culture. And the top reason is they don't wanna be seen as combative and that can come up for women and women of color, especially. Some other statistics, that slide was from Fierce as well. Only 5% of employees said that being seen as nice wasn't important. So that's just another way of looking at the risk you run if your culture is very nice. Now it's, as my mother always told me, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, right? So word choice always matters in how you say things. Anytime my children say, I don't mean to be offensive, but we all know what's coming after that. So um, picking your words carefully is also very important. And six out of 10 employees say that they have been fearful of voicing a concern at work and people are least likely to speak up in, uh, with company leaders and bosses. So one of the things you really wanna do as a leader is make it a safe place, whether that's you know sharing some concerns you might have or when somebody brings you a concern, you know, be very open to it, not only hearing it, but talking through what could be done about it or another way to look at the situation instead of just, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I get that. I can see why that's frustrating. So this was a quote from Harvard Business Review that I really liked. What's touted as niceness is often nothing more than a veneer of civility, a cute nod to psychological safety, a hologram that falsely signals inclusion, collaboration, and high performance. In many of these cultures, leaders have simply spread a thin layer of politeness over a thick layer of fear. There is an appearance of harmony and alignment, but in reality, there's often dysfunction simmering beneath the surface that results in a lack of honest communication, intellectual bravery, innovation, and accountability. So next we're gonna talk through some of the signs that you might have a nice culture. And I wouldn't say that if you have one or two of these, this is a big problem, but if you're looking through the list and mentally in your head saying, yep, 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 that's probably something you might wanna think about looking at and having some deeper conversations about. So I'm not gonna read these all to you, but I'll, I'll uh, pick out a couple to talk through. So um, if you think of some of these, like lack of accountability, tone policing, lack of trust is really in a way teaching learned helplessness. So an invisible norm of niceness can really induce conformity and passivity and learned helplessness really lowers the bar of performance. So if you listen to, you know, top leaders within the organization about the brand of politeness and how it destroys morale and it can extinguish initiative as well. So instead of challenging the environment in hopes of trying to improve things, people are really throwing their hands up and keeping quiet. And that leads to the meeting after the meeting where people talk to everyone, usually, but the decision maker about what could have been done or what they should have said and they didn't. And yet the, the department or the company is moving forward with, with a different plan altogether because nobody spoke up. I think another one to look at is this can lead to crisis activation within companies because if everybody's nice and you're having the meetings before the meetings and then the meetings after the meetings to talk about what should have happened in the actual meeting, it certainly shows a lack of trust, but it also you can get to a point where you have to make a decision or the, you realize that the wrong decision has been made. And some companies are notorious for, you know, putting their performers and bad actors in concerns rather than 
directly addressing the performance. So it may be that nice cultures nurture really false agreement and you can either be nice or you can hold people accountable, but it's really, really hard to do both. So I think one of the things that's super important is, you know, making sure you hold people accountable, whether it's to your culture or whether it's to, you know, deadlines that they may need to meet. And sometimes that can lead to hard conversations, but as a leader, I would rather have a hard conversation the first time something happens, whether it's somebody acting out in a meeting or somebody not meeting a deadline, then waiting, you know, two or three months down the road where it's happened multiple times. And now it's really a problem. So if we look at some of the other nice characteristics, um, you can start to bleed talent if people are really focused on perfectionism and everybody stops working hard because they feel like they're not being heard. And the risk of that is talented people want to have meaningful collaboration. An A player really wants a healthy culture where they're rewarded for challenging things, not just going along with the company line. Working in a, working in a toxic culture can really burn people out because they can, they may work, you know, themselves to death, right? Working 10 to 12 hours a day because they feel like that's the only way to get promoted. And then they don't have a good work-life balance. And then they start to really be unhappy about coming into work. You want to create an environment where people are happy to come to work there and want to be there. And, you know, over the course of my career, I've gotten emails from my boss at, you know, nine o'clock at Sunday, Sunday night with a not a Cox, um, but nine o'clock on a Sunday night with a dissertation that just, you know, sets off not only the end of my weekend, but I know Monday is going to be a terrible thing. So that leads to some of, that's an example of some of the increased stress that you might see. And it also really keeps you from looking at innovation. If everybody just smiles and nods along and whatever the leader may say, everybody just kind of goes with, it's, it makes it really hard to disrupt the status quo, but it, that's really the lifeblood of growth. So without people having conversations and sharing different ideas, it makes it very difficult. Innovation is really a social process as much as it is, you know, moving the, the business forward. Divergent thinking really helps people look at things a different way and then from one suggestion, it can lead to increased innovation. But if you muzzle that, your teams can, your team may be exceptionally talented, but they become a dysfunctional group because nobody's willing to speak up. So what leaders can do with the culture of nice, all leaders have good intentions. I don't think any leader walks into work and says, okay, I'm going to really mess with my team today. That's just, that's not what leaders do. But pursuing the culture of nice is a good concept because you, you can gain approval that way. It does replace genuine inclusion and motivating people to do work instead of holding them accountable. So if you think about avoiding conflict to gain approval, it's really an, a reflection of the leader's desire to be liked. Leaders often avoid conflict to stigmatize and stigmatize dissent because they'd rather be nice than be offensive, misbelieving that those are the only two choices. You can have courageous conversations and be liked at the end of that conversation because people feel like they've been heard, and then they'll trust you to have additional conversations. But if you're thinking about um, how to motivate people instead of holding them accountable, when you create interpersonal warmth, it really creates a conduit of influence, but you still need to have accountability. If you work with um, a leader who creates a toxic, nice culture in which people They'd hug each other, but then not follow through on commitments. So it's it's a veneer of agreement, and then there's a whole lot of dissension underneath it. So 
you can also another way to think of it is also you can show um, deference to the chain of command. In fear-based organizations, niceness keeps you safe. And the logic is that if you don't provoke the ire of those in power, that you have a measure of job security because you've played along and everybody thinks you're great. So of course they won't fire you because you haven't caused any, any consternation within the business. But you can't overcome a nice culture. When you think about um, what you can do as a leader, if you implement a culture of giving and receiving and asking for honest feedback, everybody makes mistakes, right? And if as a leader, you can own that and say, hey, I, I messed up. I, I did this wrong. I made the wrong decision. I made this in the wrong direction. Here's what I was thinking, but this is what happened. So I apologize to you guys. And don't just say you apologize, but actually say, do a full apology of what you apologized for why it was bad and then how you're going to fix it going forward. Um, just keep asking your team for feedback because at very le various levels of the organization, everybody sees something different. They're, everybody's in different meetings. They have different experiences. And if you open up that communication across the different levels of the organization, you're going to be in a great position to have that open and honest feedback. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but confronting issues quickly, um, it's, it's always uh, super easy to hire somebody. You can rush through that process, but it's, it's very difficult to, to terminate somebody because you've put a lot of effort into training them, right? So if you, everybody makes mistakes. So if you're able to have those conversations up front and set the, you should set the expectations initially, but if for some reason one of those is crossed or you can look at having that conversation with the person one-on-one -on -one and inquire as to why they were thinking that way or what happened. Did they have something personal come up? Did they have two deliverables due at the same time and talk through that with them? And then in clear in having that conversation, you can clarify the expectation and performance just to make sure that everybody's on the same page going forward. And sometimes as a leader, the best thing you can do is provide air cover for people who are brave enough to speak up and speak with candor as you're trying to change the culture. You wanna reward that behavior. And even you yourself challenging the public status quo, whether it's, you know, we've always done this way. I find, you know, using the Ishikawa model and asking why four times to really get to the root of the problem. Um, when I go into a new role, that's something I always do when I get the, well, we've always done it this way. Well, why? Well, why? Well, why? And eventually you'll get to the, the root cause of what that looks like and why it's being done that way. And in, in doing so, you can have an open conversation about whether that's the right way or whether it's something that um, can be done better. And there are other things that you can think of as far as how to overcome the nice culture. Um, whether it's creating a 60 second statement to kind of outline the issues at hand, offering brief examples. But this really goes back to what we talked about um, in the last slide of clarifying expectations because ambiguity can really fuel toxic niceness. So to clarify how you expect people to treat one another, hold each other accountable, you really have to be explicit on what you expect as far as intellectual honesty is concerned, including candid feedback and asking the tough questions. This change isn't an easy thing to do. So it's really imperative that you clarify and clearly explain the current state, the future state of where you want the organization to go and how the transition between the two is going to work. You can't just come in one day and say, We're, this culture of nice isn't working. We're gonna have to do something different. You were, it's a it's a long it's a long process to change that, but when you have meetings, make sure there's an agenda. Make sure there are explicit types of meetings that you want to have to make sure people stay on task and most importantly capture decisions within that. And as you practice this, right, publicly challenging the status quo that you as a leader may have helped create 
you don't need to, you shouldn't expect, I should say, others to really muscle through the fear and just decide to come in on Tuesday and start telling the truth. That's not how it works. You have to make it safe for people to do that. You have to model the behavior first and you must show that the first few people who try it, that it's a safe thing to do when they demonstrate vulnerability within the meetings and show people that candor is now being rewarded, whether you have an internal recognition system or you can, you know, congratulate them in a team meeting, appreciate them for bringing things up. Um, and when others see that you put your ego aside as a leader and your defense mechanisms aren't up when people make question decisions or things that you have said, that really gives you the pride of authorship for what you've built and it helps reinforce the change. So one of the things you can also do is schedule time to have a conversation with somebody if you need to have a tough conversation. Walking in when somebody's you know finishing up a meeting or is on a call um, and catching them off guard with a with a difficult conversation can really limit your success. So if you don't, for a performance problem as an example, when you don't address it in the moment, you're condoning the behavior and saying that it's okay. So if you hesitate to take action, you really create a lot of confusion. So if you hold people accountable privately and respectfully, people won't repeat and respect or and will respect the new boundaries and have a choice to either adopt to the new norm or find a new opportunity that may fit them better. So the other thing, the other part of this topic is really branding your family as a workplace. And this is, as we were talking about this uh, internally within, a, within Cox, we are a family owned company. So there we, while we are a family culture because we are run by a family, it's different than saying your workplace is a family. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what that looks like and some of the characteristics that might appear within that. So the definition is branding your company as a family culture can backfire unless it really is a company with only family members. Labeling a company as a family might sound positive and organizations and leaders desire a strong culture made up of employees who are bonded to each other and who push each other to new levels of performance. But when you, when you think about what that really means, I mean, that's part of being a family culture is also part of the culture of being nice. So most employees don't want another family. They want to really be a member of the team and be respected and build trust and have a common purpose as opposed to just being a member of the family. One of the things I thought um, was interesting was the implication in a family is that there are children. And so if you look at the leaders as parents and adults with unique talents, then everybody else is a child and hopefully isn't treated accordingly. But I never really, as I was researching this, I never really thought about the impact that that might have. And some people really like to keep their work and their personal life segmented off. So family language can feel overly personal and and super invasive for some people because the work-life boundaries really become blurred. Um, one of the leaders at our company has a, a tag on her email, which I really appreciate that shares that, you know, she's working right now, but she doesn't expect you to work right now. You can absolutely get back to her during your working hours, but she had some things that she needed to catch up on. And I think that's a great way to kind of help set the boundaries that, you know, you don't have to be, we're so connected these days between our cell phones and our, our computers. You could, you could work all the time if that's what you chose to do, but it's not, not a healthy thing to do. And so committed employees in a family culture are really taken advantage of. You can, you'll find that they are the ones who get, you know, they come in early, they work more than their eight hours. Um, not that you don't have to do that sometimes, but they consistently doing, do that. And they're sometimes the ones who get the most projects and then they burn out. And then you start doing what we talked about earlier in the culture of nice and starting to bleed talent. And employees who have a close relationship with their boss may be concerned about telling them negative or bad news because they don't want to be seen in a negative light. And also 
in a family culture, it's sometimes harder to have those tough conversations, making sure your employees are okay, that their mental health is okay, um, that they really have a balance in their life. And I think the most important one is looking to the leader as the head of the family who will make the ultimate decision because employees aren't bought in if on decisions that they don't have input to sometimes. So back to having those honest and open conversations is super helpful. So how you can create a better culture if your company is uh, does call themselves a family, you can change it to a tribe and move towards a mission statement that includes a group of people who are working together towards a common goal. And we talked about this a little bit earlier too, but don't hire people who are exactly like you. You can get in interviews and you click with somebody and you're like, yes, this is the perfect person. And then you have a team of nobody, everybody thinks like you and there's no innovation at all. So if you build a culture focused on purpose and go back to your mission statement, um, that'll really help drive a better culture and help people understand where you're working towards as a team. And the last one we touched on as well too is hire slowly and coach and fire quickly. So when you're making those hiring decisions, you really want that position filled and you really want to do it fast, but it, it, that is the best time even if it takes one more interview between your top few candidates to make sure that you are getting the right person for what you need in that moment for the team. And that is the end of my presentation. So Todd, back to you. Ginny, thank you for that presentation. Um, definitely for me, really interesting to, to hear uh, more about this and understand how we, you know, even here, I think about some of the ways we describe ourselves. And I, I gotta tell you, a lot of times we say that we're a family and I think that's a, a it, new way of us for us to look at it. So thank you for that. Um, for those of you in the audience, if you um, if you can raise your hand tool, if you have a question, we can we can get to you. Um, I'd like you to, if, if you could introduce yourself to the group, your name, your title, so that we know who you are. Also, you can um, put your or your comments in the Q and A box if you'd like as well. Um, I think I did see one um, one comment about appreciating the idea of rewarding candor. Can you dig into that a little bit more, Janine? Sure. Um, and it really depends on the person, right? Not not one thing is going to work for everybody. So, just even something as simple as oh, Todd, I really appreciate you bringing that up. I hadn't thought about it that way. Let's dive into that a little bit more and get some thoughts from the other members of the team. That allows you to feel validated and also brings other people along with encouragement to speak their truth. Um, to follow up on that, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, this idea that you need to move from a culture of nice to a more candid culture. And I think part of the the reaction that I know I had was there's there's so much not nice in the world I mean just get on Twitter right. for about five minutes <laughs> so how do you how do you avoid going from from sort of this nice to not nice um, and and confrontational and and really aggressive yeah that's a hard balance right because you you have to assume that everybody else has something going on in their life nobody's life is perfect every day. So some of the behavior that you may be seeing from people may just be because they're having a bad day, right? But you want to be supportive of people. You want to, you know, assume best intent always. And um, it, I think it's a hard balance to strike. I don't know that I have a great answer for that, to be honest. I don't know if any of the other committee members want to weigh in or not. But you're you're it, right. It, it is a, a tough balance. I think uh, we have a question by Jeremy, and I know there's one in the chat. So Jeremy Rios, do you want to go ahead and lead off first? Yeah, thank you, Todd. Uh, Jeremy Reyes here, project coordinator at the foundation. Um, so I, I really don't have a question, but more of a comment. And uh, Janine, I want to say thank you so much for a lot of the points that you highlighted. Um, there are things that I personally um, try to emulate myself. And, you know, one of the things that this conversation really reminded me of is what the um, overall Latin demographic and group really goes through because it is such a divisive culture. And, you know, as I identify as Latino, um, in my in one of my previous roles, you know, I used to have to host com crucial conversations and courageous conversations um, surrounding, you know, Latin identity. And 
you know, there was this constant plague of niceness culture to not offend anyone. Um, because again, the Latin uh, group is such a divisive group with different uh, political um, ide ideologies on either spectrum, as well as just, you know, values. Um, and so, you know, in my own, in my own struggle, um, it is a constant battle, I, I would say, um, within my own group, because you want to be able to get to, you know, the meat of the, the questions and the meat of the conversation. Um, but it is it is hard because at the end of the day, you don't want to turn anyone away. Um, and for me, I mean, you know, I, I've always and I'm wondering, maybe now I have a question, you know, um, do you, I guess, in your daily life or in your practice, you know, working at um, at Cox, you know, is there like a culture of rather than calling out, maybe calling in, um, you know, to try to maybe emulate some form of inclusivity or maybe I'm mistaken in that? Now, I, I love what you said about calling out versus calling in. I think that's, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but I think that's that's some great vernacular for sure. I think for me, I think it's really important to develop personal relationships with my employees and understand where they're coming from. I had a, I had a jaw dropping moment where one of the newer members of my team was the child of my children. So, okay, yes, I'm old, I'll own that. But, um, you know, thinking, <laughs> thinking about the different view that, you know, she might have versus my view on the world. I think just the fact that, you know, she and I were able to connect on some things, which is great, but she also has a different view, which I'm super excited about, about different things that we could do because she did the she did the why thing to me on uh, one of our standard practices and it really it really forced me to think and I I encourage more of that conversation I'm definitely a leader who has an open door policy but I think personal relationships are really important so people feel safe sometimes my title alone can get people scared um it's so I think it's it's but it's being honest and open and saying, you know, I never thought about it that way. Thank you for sharing that or, you know, making yourself available. So you're not, you know, the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain kind of thing. And and nobody knows who you are. They just see these random emails from you. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that question. That was thank you for sharing. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jeremy and, and Jenny, for the response. Just a comment. And you might want to comment on the comment from Sandra Bassett. In small organizations, the line between the boss and employee can get blurred, and that makes it difficult to hold people accountable. I appreciate hearing this presentation to give guidance in the uh, in the process of accountability and meeting the organization's mission. Maybe you could speak to that. A, a large uh, large company, a Fortune 500, that's one thing, but if you have a, a shop of five people, um, that's tougher. It is because everybody you know has their role and does their thing, and. Um, sometimes those roles can can overlap if somebody's sick or out on vacation, things like that. But I think that also gives you the time to build and focus those relationships and ask the the difficult questions, right? And you know, well, we could make this process. What do you think if we change this process? We might be able to do this a little bit differently. I think you know sometimes the personal relationships can be helpful because, but it all depends on how you say it. You can't just say, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This costs us hours a week, right? But hey, I've been thinking about this. It's been bothering me. I wonder if we try doing this instead of that, how that might impact us. And it might save us some time and help it get us to be able to do other things because with only five of us working in, in this group, I know we don't have enough time to do some of the things we wanna do. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that struck me was the idea that, you know, this this has to start um, from a leadership perspective. Um, what kind of leaders do do we need to think about hiring within our organizations to ensure that that we're going in the right direction? I, one of my favorite questions in the interview process is tell me about a time when you made a mistake, because I immediately know if somebody says <laughs> they've never made a mistake. One, they're lying, and two, that's not the kind of that's not the kind of person that you know you want in your organization because they're they're not going to own it, right? I, I make mistakes every day, right? Some of them are very small, some of them, like showing up to a meeting a couple minutes late, right? Because in our back-to-back -back meeting culture, sometimes that's a thing, um, you know. But it's that question to me tells me so much about the person and what they're willing to own, and then how they overcame that. My, my favorite response to that is uh, I've been known to work too hard. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think getting into this a little bit, when you, especially when you're thinking about junior team members, you know, what happens if they get a negative reaction to candor? How do we deal with that? That's hard, right? Because that can shut people down really, really quickly. They're like, well, I tried, I'm done. And it's, whether it's with team members or whether if it's with your leader, it's even worse. The leader, I think, has to have enough self-recognition to realize that they made a mistake in that moment. And, you know, first of all, you always want to decline the idea and not, you know, pick on the person. But I think sometimes in the heat of the moment that can get that can get lost. But it's, you know, everybody has a boss at the end of the day. Right. And we've all been shut down. I mean, not not all ideas are winners, but at least having the conversation is helpful. But I think I it's hard as a, as a employee to try more than once if you were shut down really hard. Absolutely. Going back to the, the hiring process, um, it's really easy to hire people that, that sort of, quote, fit in. It, it is, right? We all, we all have that tendency, no matter who we are. You know, what are some of the best ways to, to go around, to navigate around that, um, that tendency? Can you say that one more time? Well, we're, we're the, the, the idea that we want to hire sort of people like us and not, not you know, and that, that tends to lead to this culture of nice because everyone sort of thinks the same way and, and, and just kind of wants to get along um, and, and, and move along. How do we, how do we then um, hire, what do we think, how do we have to change the hiring process to ensure that we aren't doing that? I think for me, it's a conscious, it's a conscious decision. Um, I love numbers. So if you start talking to numbers, to me at work, that's kind of my love language. And uh, I'm like, okay, I can do this all day. This is great. Um, not everybody likes numbers. So for me, it's people as they're answering questions about, you know, what they've done in their job or, you know, another one of my favorite questions is tell me about a time when you had two competing priorities and how you worked through that. That question to me will tell you a lot about how people think. Like, did they bring somebody else in to help them? Did they renegotiate one of the deadlines, right? How do they work through a problem? And I think that to me really shows, because if somebody answers with math, I'm like, well, not that it'll take them out of the running, but I know enough about myself to know that that's going to be somebody who's, who's fairly like me. Because, But at the end of the day, I'm an introvert and I absolutely do not show up that way, but I have to go and reload myself. So it's finding that balance, knowing who you are is the most important thing when you're looking to hire somebody so you can be aware enough, not only, you know, diversity of, of race, but also diversity of thought. And I like what Laura put in the chat about um, building a bank of trust. That's, that is huge because everybody can have an off day, but if you've built a bank of trust, it, it makes things so much easier. Absolutely. I think that was a really powerful comment. I really appreciate it. And I think the, the next comment by Lisa, you know, people coming with baggage, having prior leaders that they, they, that, you know, they obviously couldn't trust and, and had issues with accountability makes it harder for them to challenge the start of the status quo in their next position. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I did with my team, even when I, when I came into this role five years ago, um, coming from a different place in the company, I ask dumb director questions for like a year and a half. And it's, it's not that I'm not an intelligent person, but I don't understand how this works. Can you help explain it to me? And that just showing that I was interested in learning the what and the why really helped build that bank of trust. So now people come to the leadership team across the board with, you know, suggestions of how we can do things better, different ways to improve processes because that culture was set up initially because I wanted to learn and I wanted to understand the pain points to try to make it better. So that was successful for me. Hopefully that'll help some other folks as well. Absolutely. Looks like Carla has a question, Carla. Hi, good morning everyone. Carla Morales from the Arizona Technology Council. Uh, Janine, great presentation. I love the topic. Um, I do have a question for you and for the rest of the group because I love the chat, how everybody's contributing. Um, my question to you is, I think that nice is subjective, right? Because my interpretation of nice could be very different than my employee's interpretation of nice. Um, and along the lines with what Lisa said about 
the baggage that we all carry. I guess my question is, it's twofold. One, how do we manage the previous experiences of somebody coming in or the previous experiences of a former person in leadership that impacts the current relationship now? How do you all, or Janina, from your experience, how do you all um, navigate that, that former experience to create a nice environment that is applicable and fitting for the definition for the employee and for the leader? Thank you, That's Barbara. a great question. Um, I think for me, the first thing I do with every new person that comes into my team is I set up a one-on-one -on -one for them for about 45 minutes, not only to walk through both of our backgrounds, get to know each other a little bit, but also share with them what the culture on our team is. And I prefer to think of it as a culture of calm versus a culture of nice. I, I want there to be, we work in operations and things break. It's just, it's part of the deal. Um, but it's not, it's not that things break. That's not what gets me fired up at the end of the day. It's really about how we recover. So I don't want anyone on my team in the middle of an outage thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I, and not be able to get it fixed because they're worried about the conversation they're going to have with, with their leader afterwards. So I think setting up setting up the expectations as new people come onto the team and then reinforcing those with one-on-ones or team meetings or saying, you know, I really appreciate, I keep picking on Todd, but I really, I really appreciate Todd bringing up this, um, this solution and here's what we've done. We're moving towards implementing what he suggested, because I think when you show people that that happens on a consistent basis, that then encourages more people to speak up. Does that help? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I agree with you. And I think the one on ones are crucial because you mentioned earlier about situations happening with people and how we're not family, but we are a team. Um, and those one on ones for me, I know for sure have really helped me better understand when somebody's behavior is not typical. So I know I can recognize that there's something else going on. Um, when I have those one on ones, I already prepare myself, for example, if, a, if an employee has, you know, several issues happening at home or with their children at school or whatever the case may be. My one-on-ones, the first 10 minutes has nothing to do with work. All I wanna know is what is going on? What do you feel comfortable sharing with me so that I can better prepare myself mentally to know what to expect for the following week, the following month or whatever, so on and so forth. So I agree with you. Um, it is interesting though, because I think we talk about when new uh, employees come in, but it's also an important to note that when new leadership comes in, that it's also a different transition than just in, coming in new to a group that has a current culture and how you get the buy-in from the culture that you come with and having that, that intersectionality of both cultures and bringing out the best. Because the first portion of that relationship is always going to be that sweet symbiosis of we're getting, it's like any relationship, right? We're getting to know each other. We're going to show our best selves. Um, and then eventually things comes up, but getting that, getting to know each other through those one-on-ones is crucial and very important. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Yeah. Uh, Nadia, you have a question? I do. I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, thank you, Janine, for a wonderful represent, uh, presentation. It's very insightful. Um, having worked in a variety of, of uh, um, in work environments, I appreciate Carla's comment about how culture of nice certainly can be subjective. But I think um, in coming into a work environment, there's a social contract, I think, of, you know, a baseline of mutual respect that I think serves as a foundation for understanding that everybody that is in the room in a given organization is there because of their experience and their unique skills and what they um, collectively are, are working towards and defining their mission uh, for the organization. So um, that's for me what culture, uh, the 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 work culture I find is important and uh, certainly appreciate a lot of the insights that will uh, continue kind of to help me evolve that that kind of um, frame of thinking. So thank you. You're welcome. So I don't know if you saw in the chat, Jenny, the, another interesting comment. The culture of nice is a bit scary. It's a huge risk to express candor without backlash. It's been my experience that some leaders Take it personally, and I've been and I've been reprimanded for uh, candor. To your point, these leaders didn't check their ego at the door. 
And, and that happens. And I mean, unless you are a very strong person or have the, uh, the luck of having a higher title, it makes it really hard to go back and be honest ever again, because you don't want to go through that. And that's, that to me is a huge loss of even productivity for the person that that happened to, because they're not going to be a hundred percent engaged going forward. They're going to have a level of mistrust that is, is not good for them or your organization. And that's part of where, where bleeding talent can come in. I mean, I'd love to say, try it again and see what happens, but it's really hard for, you know, you may have caught them on a bad day and we all have them, but you know, once you try two, one, two or three times and get, get the same behavior, it makes it very challenging going forward. And that's usually when people start looking for another opportunity. And I'm, and I'm assuming too, you have enough of that. You're going to start to stifle innovation as well in your company. Exactly. You're get the bare minimum, because people are afraid to raise their hand, that you might get angry. Yeah. Um, moving out, uh, out a little bit further in terms of what we're looking in terms of scope, you know, we're seeing the, the workplace evolve globally with you know practices such as remote work, flexible hours, four-day week, unlimited PTO being more widely accepted. How do you see these practices um, affecting workplace culture? I think we changed to unlimited PTO several years ago. And as a leader, I was very concerned, right? It's like, oh, I'm not going to see this person for like six weeks out of the year. But um, it didn't it didn't really turn out that way. I think people people are more likely to do what they need to do for themselves. And, you know, we've talked about people have things going on in their life, but right, there's financial pressure as, you know, prices continue to go up. There's, you know, emotional pressure. There's a huge focus now on, on mental health and mental wellness. People have a lot of things going on and it's really trying to help balance all of that in the moment. But I think as new younger people continue to come into the workforce, they're not looking for the same things that people who, you know, may be more experienced in the 60 to 65 year old range are looking for. It's a, it's a different world, but as a leader, if you don't take advantage of that different world, you're going to be stuck uh, looking at the old ways of doing things. So it's, it's, it's all about balance, but I don't know that any of those things necessarily change how we do business per se. And just taking it one step further, I mean, we're all on a camera right now and, and I don't think this would have been anything we would have done prior to 2020. Um, it, does this new hybrid or virtual world help move away from a culture of nice or is it stifle it? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, I think it depends because I know I've found myself since we've been working from home I work more because I don't have a, you know, two plus hour drive to and from the office every day. Um, I think it all depends on the interactions you have. I think if you, you know, there are certainly times of the day where I'm like, oh my gosh, another video call. But if you, if you show up honestly and authentically, this is, this can be just as good as having an in-person conversation. Certainly as humans, we need that personal interface, but this this is a this is a good way to do that. And some people are still a little sensitive about you know the surge in COVID that we may be seeing currently. I've got people on my team who are out sick right now, so they're this is a safer way for them to not be as concerned about their health. I think it's a it's like everything else. It's a mix and what you want to do with the opportunity that that you're given. One of the um, one of the things that I really value here is, is we're bringing in people that are new into the workplace or coming in from different parts of the country or the world that they're bringing in new ideas. But there is some of this that you mentioned, this idea that, uh, well, we've always done it that way. And it's it's really great. Um, you know, you mentioned this a little bit. How do you how do you diffuse some of that? Because it's very comfortable to say, well, we've done it. It's it's great versus embracing these new ideas by people that are coming in and and, and providing some candor. I, yeah, I think it's statistically companies that do the same thing the same way for decades aren't going to be around. I mean, we, we can take Blockbuster Video as my favorite example, right? They they did what they did really, really well until Netflix came along. So it's you have to continue to grow and evolve 
And that's, to me, that's the best way to do that is to have those conversations. Absolutely. Um, a couple more comments, uh, maybe for a reaction. Each interaction is meaningful on video, but I miss the breadth of hallway hellos. And, and boy, that, that's true. Uh, we, we come in here Wednesdays and, and Tuesdays, and it's great to see everybody. It really is. Um, are we missing something? I think you can be. I mean, we used to talk all the time about, you know, have your elevator chat ready to go in case you get, you know, stuck in an elevator with, uh, you know, a senior leader and you have a speech ready <laughs> to go, right? Um, it, it's different now. Like, you have to be really intentional about the connections that you make because you don't see people in the hallways. I was, uh, we go into our corporate office as well. And I literally saw somebody I hadn't seen, in, you know, since pre-COVID and it was, it was shocking. <laughs> it was, it was great to see her. But um, uh, at the same time, I, I completely agree this, just that connection of different people, because the way business gets done is through people. So having those relationships and, you know, knowing who to call when you need some help is, is super important. So I absolutely agree with that. There's an interesting quote uh, um, in the chat by Eddie that there's a tension between the concepts of safe and candor. I think safe is like nice in the sense that it is created, creating a false veneer and stifles challenging conversations. We can attempt to create a culture of dignity and respect without suggesting or implying that you can't say anything that might make you uncomfortable. And uh, it looks like Sanders agreeing with that. Any thoughts on, on that comment? in my nobody asked opinion, dignity and respect are, are always the way to start, right? But not every company has that. So I think that if you have dignity and respect, the personal connections, you can tell when somebody's off, you can tell, you know, when maybe they want to say something and kind of encourage them a little bit, but um, you do want to feel safe at work, like you, you, but safe in a way that it's, not just status quo and no, I'm just going to come in and, you know, work my eight to four and call it a day. So I think it's, I think you, but as a leader, you have to encourage having those difficult conversations and them, they start out as difficult, but as you continue to have them, it just becomes part of the culture. But we talked about that a little bit earlier is you have to encourage people to continue to move down that path because it's very, very uncomfortable for people based on some of their previous experiences. Absolutely. Well, it, it looks like that's all the questions we have. I want to give you a, a chance, Janine, to um, make any closing comments or to talk about your plans for the upcoming year before we close out. I'm super excited for the upcoming year. We have some new committee members and just like new people in your organization, that's going to give us uh, an opportunity to look at things differently. We'll continue to have talks like these throughout the year and continue to share different topics with people to help everybody continue to build their their ID and E portfolio. So I appreciate the opportunity, Todd, and looking forward to see what the committee does throughout the rest of the year. So thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, for the presentation and thank you for stepping up. Um, leadership is another uh, incredibly important uh, quality for us and uh, does he at the chamber? And we really appreciate that. And we're gonna we're committed to continuing this journey with you all. And by the way, we're we're doing it here. Um, and we're having some interesting conversations and, and very organically coming together. And I think in, a, in ways that I never expected, which uh, really warms my heart. Um, we're going to be sending out a survey on today's forum. And we'd greatly appreciate if you just take a few minutes to fill it out. So it'll help us make sure that we're serving you in the, in the best way possible um, in terms of future programming. Um, and encourage you to also spread the word about our DEI toolkit. Take a look at it. Provide us any uh, kind of feedback that you might have. And then Keep an eye out for an invite for our next DEI uh, form in the next coming weeks. And we'd love to have you with us as we walk walk beside you in this journey. So with that, uh, Janine, once again, thank you. Thank you all of, all of you for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing you the next time. Take care.